First Sergeant Kemp here with Company D, Second United States Sharpshooters. And in this episode of the Sharpshooter Workshop, we're going to talk to you about boxes and camp furniture and Civil War historical reproductions. This is going to be informative, though not exhaustive, um, with a few elements of ranting involved. So I want to be able to give you some tips and things to look out for along with some resources that I'll have down in the comment section uh, about how to make better historical reproductions. Uh, if you make and sell them, I'll have some good tips. Um, if you're interested in getting started and doing it yourself, I'll show you some neat little uh, historical insights on construction methods and give you some advice and some pitfalls to stay away from. Now, this video idea came about because I have a passion for uh, recreating and re-envisioning camp furniture. Um, so obviously if you do a campaigner impression, none of this applies because you're not going to be having any camp furniture because everything as a campaigner is going to fit in your knapsack and your haversack. Um, and really, even if you're an officer and in a late war impression, odds are you're you are carrying the bare minimum too. Um, this is sort of the necessary reality if you reenact with the family uh, or you like to portray a garrison impression, winter quarters, times when soldiers would have a little more free time on their hands and they would want to make more of a home environment. Although if you, if you read um, more Civil War journals and diaries and stuff like that, you'll see that any opportunity that the soldier had, they try to make some bit of home um, in their tiny little camp. Now, as I was saying, this came about because I was working on a campaign furniture piece and uh, I was uh, spitballing ideas back and forth with uh, Captain Whitehall. Now, uh, Skipper uh, found me some great pictures and we both had a laugh when he sent me a picture he knew I would scream at because this is a fairly nicely made um, uh, period camp table. But you can clearly see not only the modern fasteners, but also uh, <laughs> the modern ways of attaching those fasteners. And that's kind of where I wanted to start with you on this video. Fasteners did exist during the Civil War, don't get me wrong. Uh, you're mostly going to see your, your screws in, um, you know, uh, gates, uh, doors, you're going to see uh, screws in, you know, in, uh, in, in interior furniture, so uh, nice cupboards, hinges, that, that sort of stuff you're not going to see it as the go-to method of holding boards together. Um, at the time, there just wasn't a Home Depot to go to during the Civil War, so you're not going to be able to easily go out and for a couple of dollars buy 500 drywall screws and zip everything you own together and make furniture. It just didn't happen that way. And while you could get nails, cut nails, not wire nails, while you could get cut nails more easily, um, you still cherish them. So say you uh, needed to re-roof your house. Uh, you, you would save all your nails, straighten them, and reuse them. Um, even at that time, it was common for apprentices to straighten nails as part of their work up to being a... Uh, journeyman carpenter or joiner. So you have fasteners that did exist. They were not as common or well used and nicer. Um, you wouldn't use nails so much in finer pieces. There are exceptions though um, depending on where you are in the United States. Um, some cultures and some you know some areas of the country were big fans of boarded furniture um, which essentially means just that, uh, boards that were nailed together and usually decorated with paint or some sort of carving. They look pretty nice. Um, but those are kind of exceptions and limited to availability of, of nails. The other thing, the other reason why fasteners weren't used so much was because I think plywood, well I know plywood didn't exist, but I think it was because that the wood that you had was solid wood. Now, if you take wood 
and you constrict it with fasteners and you don't take the time to consider the the seasonal movement the life of wood those fasteners will crack and split your piece if you don't think about it um, that's why even if you hold it like a, a drawer bottom with a screw you don't screw the the bottom board in you cut a slot and you hold it with the screw so that way the the, the drawer bottom can expand and contract but not slide out the back of the drawer because the screws in there with a or a peg you can even use a, a dowel or something to hold it together uh, to keep it from sliding out uh, that's why you see so many more things with joinery this is my most recent thing this is a company cleaning kit. I don't really have any historical frame of reference for this. This is sort of a necessity. And since this is going to be out in the open and you know, exposed to the public so that our uh, soldiers can use the supplies they're in, uh, I wanted to make sure to use quality materials and period construction techniques and methods, at least on the outside. And you will see this entire box has absolutely no fasteners holding it together. These are all box joints like you would see in an ammo box. These are a little bit small, um, but uh, I'm gonna paint it so it's not a big deal. Um, joinery makes your boxes bulletproof. So if, this is gonna, if something you're making is gonna see a lot of abuse, you need a long line, it's gonna carry a lot of weight, you're gonna want box joints. And that's why ammo boxes had really fat box joints. Because you have to keep keep in mind those little ammo boxes held over 100 pounds of ammunition. Um, this won't see that much weight, uh, but you're still gonna wanna look for that joiner. The bottom is rabbited and dadoed um, and fit into the bottom of the box. The lid is uh, edge glued with tongue and groove that I uh, cut with my tongue and groove hand plane. Uh, the inside compartment, again, uh, dadoed and fitted out of a solid piece of wood. There's no plywood. I do have some, uh, I do have the modern fasteners that came with these hinges uh, for my mock-up, but I, I do have the slotted screws uh, to re re replace once I'm done painting this. Uh, we'll have three cubbies in this side. Uh, again, uh, I just have some uh, uh, finishing nails uh, holding the, the bottom on, but that's just mostly because it's really thin and no one's going to see that part of it and it's going to be painted. But you can see here, there's no fasteners. Everything's glued together properly and it's solid pieces of wood. One thing that's driving me nuts and I've been seeing it for years is I'll see uh, people go to the sutler and buy a wooden box and I can tell right away, oh, it's done nicely, that the wood panels are made up of many smaller pieces of wood edge glued together and made into a single box. And my first thought is, this is not Ikea, this is the Civil War, and you just wasted your money. You have to keep in mind that edge gluing boards together was common practice because sometimes you just don't have the wood. But you have to think about the construction methods of the time. If I'm gluing essentially one by twos together to make a solid piece of wood, at some point these one by twos had to be cut by hand, either by a sawyer or in the joinery shop. Then each one of these one by twos had to be cut to proper thickness, dimensioned with hand planes, joined on, on all the edges, and then painstakingly glued. Um, it just didn't make any sense in as far as craftsmanship or economy of business to spend that much time gluing little pieces of wood to make a big piece. When you, keep, when you have to keep in mind that large planks were common during the Civil War. We were still burning through old growth forests across North America at the time. And it's not uncommon to find original pieces of furniture with boards 20 plus inches wide and you, you think to yourself so okay so i'm going to have this historical reproduction of these tiny ikea pieces of wood glued together and sell it for 60 bucks no um well i think one reason is you can buy the pre-made glued up panels at the box stores 
um, and they're cheaper uh, than buying a single 1x12, which if you get select pine, where I'm at, is about $35. And if you make, uh, say, a hardtack box, you're looking at $60 to $70 in labor alone, or sorry, materials alone. Uh, so it does get expensive and your profit comes down a little bit. So, yeah, solid pieces of wood and avoid plywood. Why avoid plywood? It didn't exist. Um, you can compromise on plywood if it's something the public's never going to see and never come in contact with. This is my personal trunk. Uh, my wife is a civilian, so I have my camp in civilian, so I don't sweat about having a trunk as a first sergeant. But uh, I portray a joiner. So the other thing you have to keep in mind is your furniture, and especially your camp furniture, should represent or reflect your persona in some way. So I'm a joiner from Maine, which means I do probably home finishing work, and I probably work in the shipping industry working on ships at some point. So my trunk looks uh, reminiscent of a joiner's or carpenter's toolkit or toolbox at the time. And I have the uh, sort of the round sailor's handles uh, because I come from a maritime culture. But for example, I'll show you where ply would be acceptable. This uh, half uh, blind dovetail drawer that I have in my trunk is all, all solid wood with floating panels in the bottom. But this would be a good area to use, uh, say, an eighth inch piece of plywood or something like that, because no one would ever see it. You can even you know, make the drawer out of plywood because, again, it's hidden. But you wouldn't want to build the carcass out of plywood. That would just uh, look bad. This thing is, again, no fasteners hold the body together. All hand cut dovetails. Top is uh, tongue and groove breadboard ends with a hand cut dovetail dust skirt. So this guy is bulletproof. Where are you going to see shortcuts in construction? Essentially Civil War garbage. Uh, hard tack boxes um, are all nailed with cut nails, no wire nails. Um, the bottoms are also nailed on. The tops. Uh, generally a couple pieces of wood edge glued together. Um, and then ammo boxes. Uh, ammo boxes you'll see with, I don't know, usually inch and an eighth, inch and a quarter box joints, and then those, uh, those box joints are nailed for additional strength. Both of those items were garbage. So if you're interested in getting into woodworking and you're afraid of making something that looks bad, um, start with an ammo box because they were cranked out. Uh, a lot of them were burned, turned into seats or little little tabletops, and left behind in huge piles. So if your joints are loose or your cuts are, aren't straight, that's fine because those ammo boxes, even though back then they were made out of wood, are no different than the cardboard ones you buy at the sporting goods store today. You don't keep them for history; you throw them in the garbage. Uh, hard tack boxes were the same way. These would be uh, hacked up and repurposed for all sorts of different things. So don't be afraid to try experimenting with getting into woodworking yourself. The other thing I want to talk to you real quick about is finishing. Um, I don't feel like I see enough paint um, in period pieces. Uh, painting was very common. It was readily available. It, uh, latex paint was in existence during the Civil War. So anything, just about anything you get from um, the box store that you paint it with is going to be correct. Uh, there are going to be certain colors and hues that you'd want to stay away from. Um, but don't be afraid to paint your pieces. And if you want a good place um, to look for quality paints, you'd want to look at places like Woodcraft or Rockler. Uh, there they have, uh, you can order your milk paint finishes. This is done in milk paint. This is done in latex. Um, and you can also stain your wood. Um, this one is just a basic stain. This is one of the very first things I made by hand. And uh, basic stain with a shellac finish. Shellac, another uh, period correct preservative, though no poly, no polyurethane. Um, unless it's, again, it's something you, you have to hide. Most people, I would say 99% of people wouldn't notice. Um, uh, 
woodworkers probably would, but I don't think anyone would care. But shellac works great. You can keep adding on to it. You can get the spray stuff. You don't have to mix the flakes with alcohol if you don't want to. And again, dovetails. So you can have paint, stain. Um, I do boil linseed oil and I do raw stuff like this. Um, one thing I, I will say is please stop antiquing things. I see it way too much at events or online. This stuff was new during the Civil War and people get so like worked up about making their stuff look old. It's like, it's not old. It's old, it would be old to us, but it would have been new then. So it's okay for your stuff to look nice and to look new because it would have been. Um, so don't go all crazy antiquing stuff. The only stuff that I antique is uh, like on the screw video on how to make it look like it was blacksmith, but that's not, that's just using you know modern methods to make something look like it was made originally and would have looked new from a smith or from a, a machinist. So um, again, think wood construction, wood finish, the other thing too is, say you already have stuff and you're already pretty happy with it, but you want to take it to that next level because you want to impress uh, a woodworking nerd like myself next time they see your camp. Um, period furniture is covered in different marks. Now, if, you, if you're a furniture maker looking to put a piece in a competition, you're going to be more thoughtful about your marks. You're not going to leave them so willy-nilly. But for the average joiner, average carpenter, or the average uh, homeowner at the time, you would be using some common uh, tools to mark your pieces. Pencils did it, exist, but these are far more accurate, and these were in the tradition. Uh, most people wouldn't think to use a pencil when a marking knife is 10 times more accurate in laying out. Uh, it also gives you uh, cleaner cuts when you're finishing everything. So. These dovetails, these box joints, are laid out, I use a cutting gauge, but you can use a, uh, a square and a marking knife. And you can't, you probably can't see it, but there is a gauge line running all along this side and on the back side of where the end of my cut is for my dovetails. And that's sort of a, a quick way to kind of show that maybe this was handmade. Even if you use a router to cut your dovetails or you know a table saw or router to cut your, cut your box joints, you can still leave the telltale marks of hand woodworking on your pieces with a few marking tools. So that's a nice little, uh, a little tip that you can do. Make sure you have fasteners in all the appropriate places. These, um, when, when you when you're trying to make campaign furniture or camp furniture, you want to think about the fasteners that you're using. So if you're an army on the move and you're setting up for winter quarters, the hinges and accoutrements that you're going to put on your furniture needs to represent stuff you would have scavenged. So hinges could be a little more ornamental because odds are you and your pards broke into an abandoned house and uh, took the hardware off of um, a hutch or uh, you know some sort of cabinet with some doors on it, uh, and that's kind of would reflect the sort of hardware you would find on your pieces. So it wouldn't be out of place for something that you made in camp to have, say, a really nice ornamental hinge because that's what you found. Um, they don't always have to be super rustic and old. Um, and since we're on joinery and marking lines, um, one thing, I, one last thing I want to say is box joints and finger joints are two different things. Um, ammo boxes you're going to see have really wide box joints, um, kind of like like these but bigger. And the reason why they're big is because they were cut by hand. And so you need to be able to have room to work, and you want the joints to be big enough so they can go quickly. You know, you're looking with, uh, you're looking at hand saws, and coping saws, and chisels to cut these joints out. Um, table saws did exist during the Civil War, but they weren't widespread, and they weren't even that common in sort of like the manufacturing sector yet. 
the finger joints that you see on, oh, I like those old Winchester or Remington ammo boxes you see in antique stores where they're, it's just like one, one eighth inch joints going all the way down. Those are definitely post civil war. So you want to stay away from that construction method uh, because those were all cut by table saws um, at the time. So you're going to be looking at either boarded furniture like this uh, or this trunk, um, or you're going to be looking at joint. So it's going to be wide box joints, but when in doubt, kind of dovetail. There's fantastic videos out there on the web on how to cut dovetails. Anyone can do it. Uh, you, you don't even have to have fancy pants saws. I've seen them, people use hack saws with really great accuracy. So this is just sort of my little rant, my little, uh, little tips and tricks thing. So one last time, use solid wood. Go easy on the fasteners. Learn to cut a joint. Don't antique your stuff. Don't be afraid of paint. Um, and yeah, learn how to cut a joint. And then the other thing too is don't be afraid of glue. Uh, all these things are held together at some point with glue. Glue is oftentimes stronger than a fastener and oftentimes stronger than the wood itself. So don't be afraid to use your glue. If it's out, if it's exterior, like this box is going to be, I'll use a uh, Type Bond 3, the waterproof, although this Type Bond 2 would be more than adequate because this is going to be painted in ordnance red. Um, if you're doing interior stuff, fine stuff, um, hide this uh, modern hide glue works wonders, especially when it comes time to finish. Uh, not for outdoor use at all because uh, it's water soluble and you can steam this loose if you ever had to take it apart again. That's what that's for. It's also really popular among instrument makers. Um, so glue, go easy on fasteners. You can get uh, cut nails from you know Woodcraft or Rockler. Uh, I get mine from uh, a great website online. I'll put down in the comments section or in the description down below. So if you have any questions at any point about uh, period correct construction methods, marking, materials, design, be sure to leave us a question uh, or a comment down below. I'd be happy to answer your questions um, and help you uh, on your camp furniture for reenacting. Again, this is not by any means an exhaustive conversation about uh, historical woodworking, but just wanted to get the ball rolling. Um, thanks again so much for joining us in the Sharpshooter Workshop, and we'll catch you next time.